Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are on the home stretch for our TCHMB virtual summit for 2022. And I want to thank you guys for all hanging in there till the end of the day today. Uh, we have a really great lineup of speakers for this afternoon to uh, give you some information about the newest OB project uh, that the collaborative is uh, taking on related to postpartum uh, preeclampsia. So this session is entitled Recognition and Response to Postpartum Preeclampsia in the Emergency Department. And uh, our first uh, 30 minutes, we'll have the current co-chairs of the OB committee, as well as the project lead for the uh, postpartum preeclampsia initiative to talk with us about coordinating postpartum preeclampsia using a multidisciplinary approach. Our speakers for this afternoon, for this first part of the session, uh, Christina Davidson, you've heard from before, all their bios are in the um, online. You can see those there, but I'll briefly go through each of them. Uh, Christina Davidson is a board certified MFM specialist and vice chair of quality, patient safety and equity for the Department of OBGYN at Baylor College of Medicine and chief quality officer for Texas Children's Hospital. She's also co-chair of the TCHMB OB subcommittee and chair of the SMFM patient safety and quality committee. Our next speaker is James Hill. He is a board certified MFM specialist and division chief for the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in San Antonio. He is also co-chair of the TCHMB OB committee and medical director for the Christus Hospital at Westover Hills in San Antonio. Our next speaker is Ms. Gloria Delgado. Uh, she's an administrator, assistant administrator for women's services at the University Medical Center El Paso. She graduated from the University of Texas El Paso with a bachelor's of science in nursing and subsequently obtained a master's degree in nursing and healthcare systems management specialization from Loyola. And she is also a co-chair of the OB subcommittee. Our last speaker is uh, Ms. Lolly Perry. She's a maternal educator for the perinatal and neonatal outreach program at University Health Systems in San Antonio. And she's currently working as the project lead for the uh, postpartum hypertension preeclampsia initiative in the, in the emergency department. So welcome team, and I'll hand it over to you, Christina. Thank you, Pat. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you all for joining us. We're so excited to share the next hour and a half with you, and we're really excited to present our new OB committee project to you. And just to give some background as to why this is so important to us, we um, thought we would share with another patient, uh, start with a, sharing another patient story. And as we've learned over the last couple of days, the um, power of the patient's voice is, is really, really important. And I think there's no better way to describe why we feel so passionate about this project than to hear from Shalon Irving's mother. Unfortunately, we can't hear from Shalon herself. Shalon was a Lieutenant Commander in the uniform ranks of the US Public Health Service, and she was also a CDC epidemiologist. And we're going to share a video that you can find on the Council for Patient Safety website is um, in which Shalon's mother shares her story. So without um, further delay, I'm going to hand it over to our TCHMB team to play the video. So truly sorry, mommy. I hope you know how much I love you and how much you mean to me. I am sorry that I have left you. On the particular day that I am writing this, I have no idea how that may have occurred, but know that I would never choose to leave you. You will forever be my mommy and I your baby girl. Shalon was my only daughter. She was loving, she was kind, she was generous. She was just always a curious child and loved to learn. She graduated from high school after skipping two grades. She went on to get her bachelor's at Hampton University. From there, she got a master's of science and then was accepted into a PhD program at Purdue University. She graduated with a dual PhD in both sociology and in gerontology, and she was the first student to do that at Purdue University. Both degrees were summa cum laude and all by the age of 25. She went on to public health because she had watched her brother who was battling MS, so she decided she'd go and get a master's of public health from Johns Hopkins and then went on to become a well-respected epidemiologist at the Center for Disease Control. Unfortunately, her brother passed away, but she still devoted the work that she did 
at the CDC to her brother. Shalon was a very adventurous spirit and we had traveled to over 20 countries in the last five years. She just loved life. When Shalon found out that she was pregnant, she was just overjoyed. She had wanted to be a mother for so long. She went to every single OB appointment. She did everything her obstetrician required of her. She had had um, fibroids removed probably a year before the pregnancy. And then she found out at the time that she had factor V Leiden. So she also had to take two painful shots every day to keep from clotting while she was carrying her baby. Well, based on her history, her medical team thought it was best that she have a planned C-section. She was prepared, she was ready, and she couldn't wait to meet the tiny human that she'd been sharing space with for 37 weeks. Shalon had tears in her eyes. She was so, so excited to see her daughter, and Shalon just held her. Within four or five days after getting home, she developed a lump on her side. She started having other symptoms as well, headaches. She wasn't voiding as she should have been. Her legs started to swell. She started to gain weight. She had headaches. And every time we'd go in to see a doctor, she was just dismissed with, you just had a baby, give it time. It'll get better. And she says, Mom, I, I don't feel right. There's something wrong. And I was just so concerned, but I, I didn't know what to do. During the last week of her life, Shalon went to the doctor three times for the same symptoms. On that last visit, she presented with blood pressure of 174 over 120. Well, let me give you some blood pressure medicine and you go home and come back in a couple of days if it hasn't gotten better. But don't worry, it should be fine. Just give it a little more time. Well, after we left the doctor's office, we went um, and picked up her prescription and we came home. And so we were sitting there um, talking a little bit more and all of a sudden um, she started to have this gargled sound that came out of her mouth and her her arm shot up and she passed out and i called 911 probably five or six minutes later the ambulance was there when i got to the hospital um the emergency doctor told me that she was in pretty bad shape i found out a couple of days later that she was brain dead because of the lack of oxygen my cousin brought in a medical directive that I didn't even know Shalon had. And it said, Mommy, I will fight hard, but if there is no hope, please let me go. And the next night, I happened to notice just one tear. It seemed like that came out of one eye. And I knew then what I had to do. We had her taken off life support. At 9.14, she was gone. I lost my vibrant, beautiful, intelligent, best friend and daughter because she wasn't heard. I knew Shalon was a high-risk pregnancy because of her age, but I never for a moment thought that she was at risk of dying because she was a black woman. Next slide, please. I, I agree, that's a very touching story. And so I'm gonna to talk today, I'm Dr. Hill, I'm gonna to talk today about a quality improvement project that we're proposing to implement in the state of, of Texas. Next slide. These are the specific objectives that I, I hope to accomplish today with my team. Next slide. 
So I'm going to sort of talk about the why uh, for this project, and then I'm going to pass the baton off to Gloria, who's going to give sort of a high level discussion on the aims and goals of our project. And then she'll be followed by Lolly, who will talk about how to implement this project and who are the key stakeholders and the importance of having experts in our planning group to help put this project in place. And then Dr. Ramsey will come back on and give a, a roundtable discussion with uh, some, some panelists to talk a little bit more about the project. Next slide. I think that, that video that we just saw speaks volumes to this issue. And the issue is that maternal death is a crisis. And you've heard it in the news, you, you've seen it in the literature. I think we've got to get our arms around this, this issue. Next slide. So if we look what's happening in the United States, you look at this graph, this looks at the trends in maternal or pregnancy related mortality in the United States from about 1987 to 2015. And this is data from the CDC. And you can clearly see that the number of reported pregnancy related deaths in the United States is steadily increasing. From about 7.2 deaths per 100,000 live births in 1987 to about 18 deaths per 100,000 in 2015. Next slide, but how do we compare with other high income countries? So if you, if you look at Australia, you look at Germany, you look at Norway, you look at the United Kingdom, this graph shows us that the maternal mortality rate in the United States seems to be going in the opposite direction in comparison to those other high income countries. So if you in comparing the maternal mortality rate in the United States with those other high income countries, the US maternal mortality rate almost doubled that of most other developed countries. Next slide. And so the CDC also says that in addition to this increase in mortality, about 60 to 70,000 women experience some type of severe maternal morbidity each year. Next slide. So what is what is Texas doing about this? Next slide. What I want to share with you in the next couple of slides is some findings from a joint biannual report from the Texas Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee and the Texas Department of State Health Services. They published this report in 2020. So let me kind of go through some of those findings for you. Next slide. But first, if you look at the scope of this Texas Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee that's guided by the Texas Health and Safety Code, we can see that that review committee has a number of responsibilities. However, its primary responsibility is to study and review those cases of pregnant related deaths in Texas. In order to do that, one of the basic questions that that committee has to answer is, if she had not been pregnant, would she have died? Next slide. And so some of the other key questions that the review committee is charged with working to answer are listed here on the slide. And I'm gonna kind of take you through in the next few slides, some of the documented findings from that joint report in answering some of these questions. And, and I think these slides are very relevant to, to why we are proposing this statewide project. Next slide. So listed here are the eight underlying causes of death that accounted for a large majority of those pregnancy related deaths from about from that report that uh, uh, the uh, review committee reviewed the 200 of the 2013 cases. And what you can see here is that preeclampsia and eclampsia were amongst the most frequently observed leading causes of death. And these findings are very comparable to what's being reported by the CDC. But I think what's also important in understanding this crisis is it's not just the death itself, but we have to understand when did that death occur? Next slide. So looking at the timing of death, what you see here is among all of the 54 pregnancy related deaths that were reviewed by the committee from that 2013 cohort, 71% occurred in the postpartum period. 
and it was 40% in the first six weeks, and then 31% occurred from postpartum day 43 up to one year from the end of pregnancy. But if you look at this data a little bit closer, on that graph on the right, what you can see is that 100% of those pregnancy-related deaths that were caused by preeclampsia or eclampsia, 100% occurred in the postpartum period. So the next big question is, can we prevent this death? And on this particular slide, we're talking about preventability, and you can see the definition from the review committee. What I think is striking here is that when they reviewed those 2013 cases, 89% of those pregnancy-related deaths were considered to be potentially preventable, almost 90%. But again, more strikingly, if you look at it specifically in terms of preeclampsia and eclampsia, you can see that 100% of those deaths they found there was not only some chance, but a good chance that the pregnancy-related death potentially could have been prevented due to this hypertensive disease. Next slide. And so the review committee also looked at the contributing factors and identified uh, close to 90 factors. But what I have listed on these next three slides, and I'm not gonna go over them in detail, but these are the top contributing factors involved in those deaths. And what I will tell you as we quickly go through these last three slides is that the underlying theme in these slides are poor quality of care. Next slide. Delay in care. Next slide. Lack of knowledge. Failure to recognize and failure to obtain a referral or consultation in the appropriate time. Next slide. So hopefully what I've shown you today very briefly is that in Texas, preeclampsia and eclampsia is a leading cause of maternal mortality in the postpartum period, but it's preventable. And so what we're hoping is that this postpartum project with a focus on patients who will return to your emergency center will get the best care they so desperately need. Next slide. And so if we join hands, we can make a difference. So let's just change what we're doing in hopes that we get better results. And I'll turn it over to Gloria at this point. Thank you, Dr. Hill. I will present in the aims and goals of the project. Next slide, please. So the project alignments with, aligns with regulatory compliance initiatives. This project will support hospitals and emergency departments to meet requirements to the provision of care, treatment, and services standards for maternal safety from the Joint Commission regards to standard PC 060301, reduce the likelihood of harm related to maternal severe hypertension preeclampsia. Requirement one, develop written evidence-based procedures for measuring and, and remeasuring blood pressure. These procedures include criteria that identify patients with severely elevated blood pressure. Requirement two, develop written evidence-based procedures for managing pregnant and postpartum patients with severe hypertension preeclampsia. Next slide, please. This project complements the work of the Texas Department of State Health Services, Texas Inc. program. DSHS is the coordinating organizations for implementation of Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, Maternal Safety Bundles in hospitals and throughout Texas. The goal of these bundles is to prevent maternal deaths and reduce severe maternal morbidity. This project seeks to help coordinate, it, uh, coordinate emergency care for postpartum patients experiencing signs and symptoms of postpartum preeclampsia through TCHMB's partnership with the RAC PCR Alliance. Next slide, please. So the project description. The project seeks to reduce maternal morbidity and mortality related to severe hypertension in postpartum patients by identifying preeclampsia with postpartum patients helping coordinate emergency care for postpartum patients experiencing signs and symptoms of postpartum preeclampsia through TCHMB's partnership with Regional Advisory Council, the RAC and Perinatal Care uh, Region uh, PCR Alliance. Next slide, please. Initial global project goals. Each participating emergency center will increase their assessment of pregnancy status and birthing people in the postpartum period. Each participating emergency center will increase first line medication administration between 60 minutes to postpartum people with hypertensive episode. 
Each participate in emergency center will increase timely transfer of postpartum people with hypertensive episodes to obstetrics. Next slide, please. So I'm going to review the project uh, goals. Next slide, please. As we mentioned, we're going to be following the aims for our structures, which is going to be read readiness, recognition, response, and reporting system learning. Next slide, please. So in the readiness section, uh, number one, we will ensure staff structure and protocols are prime to provide recommended care for postpartum pre patients presenting to the emergency center with severe hypertension. Number one, a standard for early warning signs, diagnostic criteria, monitoring and treatment of severe hypertension, preeclampsia with severe features, and or eclampsia to include appli applicable order sets and algorithms. Number two, Emergency centers education on severe hypertension protocols, culture of team for include in situ sim simulations and unit based drills and debriefs. Number three, process for timely triage and evaluation of postpartum women. Number four, rapid availability and access to stock hypertension and preeclampsia medications administration and administration guide. Next slide, please. The second goal of the readiness will be system plan for escalation, obtaining appropriate consultation and transport of patients as indicated. System plan, education, and training and communication about accurate documentation of self identified race, ethnicity, and primary or, or preferred language. Number two, system plan for escalation, obtaining appropriate obstetric consultation and timely transport of postpartum hypertensive patients as indicated. Next slide, please. On the recognition and prevention section, uh, we will identify postpartum patients presenting to the emergency center with severe hypertension. Number one, standard protocols for acute, accurate measurement and assessment of blood pressure and urine protein. Number two, standard response to early warning signs. Listen to patients, invest, investigate symptoms, and assess labs. Number three, facilitate wide standardized patients and family education on signs and symptoms of hypertension and preeclampsia anticipatory guide, guide, guidance I'm sorry, for urgent maternal warning signs. Number four, mechanisms and process for patient, family, and staff reporting experiences of inequality or disrespectful care. Next slide, please. And the response section, the goal will be to treat in 60 minutes of first severely elevated re reading every postpartum patient with a a acute onset of severe hypertension or preeclampsia. Facility-wide standard protocols with checklists of escalation policies for management, treatment, and coordination of follow-up and transition of care for severe hypertension, eclampsia, seizure prophylaxis, and postpartum presentation of severe hypertension or preeclampsia. And also use a shared decision-making model. Next slide, please. This is an example of the emergency department postpartum preeclampsia checklist that is uh, the the, the team of the water rack has been working on, so it's just an example for you to, to have a visualized um, example of the checklist. Next slide, please. Yes, next slide. Thank you. The, um, on reporting and system learning, foster a culture of safety, equity, and improvement for care of postpartum patients presenting to the East emergency center with severe hypertension. Cultural communication include briefs, huddles, and post-event debriefs for patients at risk or impacted by severe hypertension to identify opportunities for success. Multidisciplinary review of severe hypertension preeclampsia cases associated with severe maternal morbidity and quality improvement efforts from review of, ca of cases and data. On this, um, the reporting uh, section, we need also need to take consideration of the Joint Commission Sentinel event of severe temporal harm without death process that requires multi multidisciplinary review to identify potential hazards and vulnerability that impacts patient safety and learn from, from there. Uh, this completes my presentation. Uh, next, we have Ms. Lolly uh, Perry, who will present work groups and implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the million dollar question, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> Hopefully uh, you can. Yes, we can hear. Okay, very good. Um, welcome to part three of our presentation. My name is Lolly Perry, and I'd like to share with you what our work group is working on now and how you can help out with this very important project. First, I'd like to reiterate one point that Gloria made, that the Texas Collaborative complements the work of Texas AIM. That key word there is that we complement the work of Texas AIM, as you probably heard several times during this conference. We're not reinventing the wheel for management of hypertension and pregnancy. 
but focusing on hypertension in the postpartum period as emphasized by the statistics that you saw from Dr. Hill. And what a brilliant idea, not mine, to partner with the Regional Advisory Council's uh, perinatal care regions, the RAC PCRs, to coordinate care for postpartum patients with preeclampsia. This aligns with the Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee recommendation to support coordination between emergency, emergency and maternal health services and implement evidence-based standard protocols to identify and manage obstetric and postpartum emergencies. So we need experts. We need experts, obviously, in severe hypertension, experts with anybody having to do with emergency centers, experts in the operations of the RAC, PCR, operate experts in care coordination personnel, such as nurses. Nursing is a key component for any change in healthcare. And hospital administration, uh, hospital administrators are a bonus for buy-in. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a flow diagram describing how TCHMB is working with Texas AIM to have a process in place for recognition of, pre, uh, of postpartum preeclampsia. And we'll create a work group through the RAC PCR, the re and we'll call it the reinforcement cohort to implement our initial activities of the project. Let me describe the initial activities in cohort. Next slide. Of course, we'll have to uh, we'll have the enrollment from Texas AIM. And we have to create a process to identify these patients, implement this process, and develop management tools for use by the emergency department. Disseminate these uh, clinical management tools, and from there we'll get feedback, have a baseline, and of course, like you've heard on on the QI, uh, we have to analyze our collective data to identify the effectiveness of tools and processes. And now for the cohort reinforcement. Ideally, two members per PCR rack. We have 22 racks. That means 44 people will be uh, chosen to attend quarterly webinars, conduct QI projects, and provide data through the AIM portal. They'll be attending regular check-in calls, educate and support hospitals in their cohort using uh, national resources, and they will develop and shamelessly share the old AIM adage, share tools and materials. Don't be frightened by the QI portion. We have QI experts to help. And if you like QI, by all means, join in. Next slide. Next slide, please. Unless Sam went next time. So, um, we will be sending out welcome packets and uh, notifying uh, of our participation guidelines and action calls. Action calls will be scheduled in between the learning sessions. For the cohorts, we think of them as teams, teams that test and implement changes in their local setting, teams that collect data and submit monthly progress reports to measure the impact of those changes. As a team, we will build collaboration and support those hospitals as they try out new ideas, even from a distance. Next slide. I'd like to end with an African proverb that I think appropriately describes the work of TCHMB. If you wanna go quickly, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Thank you so much and Consider joining us. This is a this is a great project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perry, very much for that excellent presentation, and Dr. Davidson and Dr. Hill and Ms. Delgado for uh, working through this project. I think it's a really important project that's very well timed with the rollout of the Texas AIM Hypertension Bundle and the Joint Commission standards. So I think this is really a a great project. So thank you all for your hard work on that. And again, if anybody's interested in participating in the project or getting more involved, the emails are on the screen. Uh, I failed to introduce myself at the beginning. I'm Patrick Ramsey. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the Collaborative. Uh, I'm also a maternal fetal medicine specialist in San Antonio, and I've been working with the Collaborative for the past uh, five to six years. So I uh, really enjoy the work we're doing, and it's getting better in every day. 